Let me, let me remind you that your final project proposal is due in about a week and a half. All right. The same day, that's the beginning of lab four, <coughs> beginning of lab four, you have lab four homework, the final project proposal, and the lab three write-up all do the same day. Two, uh, maybe two and a half weeks. Therefore, it's time to start writing the final project proposal so that you don't have to do all three of those the night before there's, they're due and come to lab looking like your eyes were dipped in cornmeal and deep fried. <coughs> so, <laughs> you feel like that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, get a head start on it. Any questions about this write up? You need, you, need a, you need a paragraph of general description. Oh yes, one of the requirements, one of the requirements for the final project write up is the uh, nine second sound bite. You have to describe your project in one sentence. All right, that should be a good way to start the project proposal. If you can't describe your project in one sentence, you probably haven't thought it through. <laughs> well, you know, not too many dependent clauses. It has to be parsable by a uh, by by normal reader. And uh, uh, you know, you're going to probably want to include block diagram, uh, flow charts, guess of, as the hardware. Hardware versus software trade-offs, parts list, various items like that. Uh, there's a, there's more description in the homework five description. Uh, but um, any questions on this? So the the point of this exercise is not to grade you on your on your proposal idea as much, there is a little of that, but it's mostly to get a feel, for you to get a feel for, as to whether what you propose is doable, <coughs> whether, it's, whether it can actually be constructed in five weeks, and, uh, and occasionally we have to say to people, well, this is probably a two afternoon job, but usually we have to say, there's no possible way you're going to do this in five weeks. You know, I'm going to I'm going to build a TCP/IP stack. <gasps> you know, something like that is just it's just a, an awful lot of code. So, so the this is more prescriptive than than uh, than uh, an exercise to grade you, but. We want to have a well worked out proposal, and you need a well worked out proposal so that when you get back from break, one week after you get back from break, you're going to be ordering parts and building stuff. So, of course, some of you already are, but, uh, but uh, you need to think about this a lot, like this week and next week. Okay, enough of that. Lab three. Any questions about, yes? Um, why do we set the end up first? Uh, because I'm lazy? Why, the question is, why did, you set the, I, why did I set the PWM to inverted? Um, there's no reason. Since, since humans are almost completely phase insensitive, it doesn't matter if the waveform is upside down or right side up. And so I paid almost no attention to whether it was inverted PWM or not. It just changes the, it's like, it's like putting the signal through an amplifier of gain minus one. You just can't hear the difference. Yeah, like, uh, can you give more like specifications about what, like you mentioned we have to implement at least two voices and maybe more. So what's the definition of voice? Yeah. Voice is a single instrument 
or a single note being played at a time. Okay. And so humans are constructed to only have one voice at a time. You can't say two different things at a time. There are very few people who can sing two different notes at a time or, or make two different notes at a time by humming one and whistling another. But our vocal cords are not designed to make two different notes at the same time. Although birds are, interestingly. Birds have two sets of vocal cords and can make two different tones at the same time. That's two tones, but they're not very spectrally pure. So, so uh, but birds can make two completely different sine waves at the same time because they have two sets of vocal cords. Yes, so for example, if we have two voices, does that mean like we have to output them like at the same time, right? Not yes. I'll put them at the same time. At the same time. Okay. Typically, you would add them. And so the output, the final output channel for everything is going to be OCR0A. You're going to load the output compare register because in pulse width modulator mode, the counter, the timer counts up from 0 to 255 rolls over, counts up again. In other words, it just keeps overflowing and counting. You can think of OCR0A as a threshold above which the output is a 1 and below which the output is a 0. So as you move OCR0 to a lower value, you get more output, more average output. As you move OCR0A to a higher value, you get less average output, hence the inverted. And so your, all of your output, so each one of these cycles is one sample time whose average value gives you the value of the sum of all of the voices. Which obviously have to add up to a number between 0 and 255. Otherwise you'll get overflow. And when you get overflow, you get extremely annoying distortion. It sounds like crackling. It sounds like uh, very sharp edges, Fourier, uh, high Fourier components due to sharp edges in the waveform. And yeah, go ahead. When you say adding, it's just like plus. Plus the voltage, right? No voltage here. Numbers. We're still all talking numbers. We're not talking voltages yet. So you're going to calculate some output sine wave from some table. All right, so you're going to have some output from some table which is going to have some envelope imposed upon it by the, by the rise time dynamics and the fall time dynamics. And this is going to be a number, better be a number with two voices, it better be a number between 0 and 128. And you're going to add another number to it which is a separate voice which might have a fast rise time and a long all time. So you can add these two together and put them out through OCR 0A. And we don't have to do, even we add them, we don't have to normalize it again, right? Well, I just did normalize by, di by making the max oh, 128. Yes. You lose some resolution in amplitude as you increase the number of voices. The amazing thing is that it sounds as good as it does. It's like a, you know, like a dancing dog. It's not that they're such great dancers, it's amazing they can do it at all.
Yeah? Timer 1 is the 16-bit timer, and you could go to a 16-bit PWM. The problem is that because the PWM is linear in time, if you go to a 16-bit PWM, it takes 65,000 cycles on the CPU to get through all 16 states. And, you don't have, and it takes your sample rate down so far you can't do anything with it. That's... That limits your bandwidth to like 50 hertz or something. You know, good baseline, 16-bit baseline. Say again. Couldn't you increase the increment? Increase the uh, yes, but then of course you no no you can't increase the increment. Actually, for timer one, for timer one you can set the resolution of the PWM to something else besides 8 and 16. I can't remember what you can set it to. Anybody memorize that yet? I haven't even memorized that one. Uh, but, um, but you can change it. Say if you want to go to 10 bits or 12 bits, you might be able to get away with that. Okay, so what I thought I would do today is to write out the whole FM synthesis code for one voice so you can see it all in C. It's online, but it's often useful to go through it. And it gives you another excuse to ask questions about this strange form of arithmetic we're going to be using where, where multiplies are replaced by shifts as much as possible where differential equations are replaced by a shift in an add, and where sine wave computation is replaced by uh, direct digital synthesis. So I'm not going to go through all the declarations, which are boring, but I'll, but I'll um, let's start talking at main here. We have to init the UR, we have to init the sign table, but initting the sign table is, is, as we talked about last week, is straightforward. We're going to init it from plus 127 to minus 127 from 0 to 255, indices from 0 to 255. So we're going to normalize a sign to one byte, a car, uh, car uh, two's complement. And all the arithmetic is going to be done in two's complement until the very last moment of truncating it and, and adding 128 to normalize it to 0 to 255. We're going to run timer 0 at the full rate. TCCR0B is going to be set to 1. That's full rate on, on the timer. We're going to turn off time at TIMSK0. In other words, we are going to not interrupt in any way on timer 0. And we're going to turn on the pulse width modulator mode and connect the output to the uh, uh, to B.3 to pin B.3. So TCCR0A gets bits COM0A0, COM0A1, WGM. Zero zero and WGM zero WGM zero one. So these two connect the I.O. pin, these two turn on pulse width modulator mode, and let me remind you again that once you've done this, you cannot use this timer for any kind of timing. 
It is now a pulse width modulator. It is an analog output. It is not useful for timing any task. And we're going to set OCR0A to 128, which when we get done normalizing all the arithmetic is going to have the analog value 0. It's the average value. Half scale. Now, timer 1 is going to control the audio sample rate. PWM is running, so this is, this is 62,500 hertz PWM. OCR, OCR1A is going to be set to 1999, 2000 cycles between interrupts time mask 1 is going to be set to to turn on the output compare interrupt enable 1a bit so that we we reset so that we interrupt after 2000 cycles is that TCCR0B to, oh, this was cheesy, 0x9. That's, that's the full speed bit plus the com clear on compare match bit. And we're going to turn on the interrupts. The TAs discovered an interesting thing when they programmed this up. And that is that if you start timer 1 and then init the LCD here, then turn on the interrupts. By the time you're done initting the LCD, more than 2,000 cycles have passed on timer 1. And so what happens? It can't interrupt on compare match because the interrupt bit was turned off. Say again? It goes all the way around to so 62,500 and then starts counting up and the next time it gets to 2,000 it takes the interrupt. And you calculate that out and it turns out it's about 8 seconds. Yeah. Something like that. And so the symptom will be you, 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 you set everything up and the system sits there and stares at you and does nothing for 8 seconds and then behaves normally. 8 seconds is just long enough for you to say what the heck is wrong? And hold up your hand. Right? <laughs> and, then, and then it starts to play. And you'll get really tired of waiting that eight seconds, so think about it. Can you say one more time what's, what's, the, what's actually happening? It takes longer than 2,000 cycles to init the LCD. Therefore, the counter will be passed uh, 1999, by the time you turn on interrupts, it'll miss the interrupt and the counter will wrap before it takes the interrupt. There. So, the thing to do is, just before you initialize, after you do the init LCD, then you set TCCR TCNT1 to 0 and then turn on interrupts. And that's all good. One. Thank you.
So now we need some sound parameters. And there's going to be two, there's going to be two increments we need. One is main, that's going to be the main sine wave we're generating. That's the, that's the fundamental, that's the, uh, the, the note that we're generating. <clears throat> and there's going to be a inc FM, which is going to be the phase increment for the FM modulation signal. And as we talked about last time, inc main is going to be cast to int of 8.192 times whatever frequency you want, uh, some f out here. And inc fm is going to be cast to int of 8.192 times frequency fm. So if you want to play middle C, F out would be 262 or so. And if you wanted to make something that sounded like a string being played at, at middle C, you might make this 262 and you might make this 512 or so. Yeah? I thought I derived that in class last week. It's uh, it's two to the two to the sixteenth divided by eight thousand. Okay, yeah. Another question over here. Question. Guys? Question? Huh? Okay. Now, we need a decay rate. You remember there's going to be a, there's a tau rise and a tau fall for the, for the amplitude of the main sine wave. And if you'll remember from a couple of lectures ago, we recoded the exponential in such a way that the, that the fall time was represented by a negative power of 2. Remember, we took this as, let me see if I can figure that out again now. Try and write it out in the same syntax I had it last time. Except that I already filed it. Oh, no, I didn't either. So we rewrote the differential equation as yn plus 1 is equal to or xn plus 1 is equal to x to the n minus x to the n shifted by p, if you will remember. So this is a way of setting how much we're going to subtract off of, off of each x, and how much we're going to subtract at each time step, and so it reflects the falling phase here. And we're going to set all we're going to specify for the falling phase is P. And so we're going to set the, we're going to set the decay main to 4. That is to say, every time through this loop, we're going to lose about uh, one sixteenth of the amplitude. Every time we evaluate this, we're going to lose about one sixteenth of the amplitude.
the time constant for rise on this on this particular instrument is going to be zero which means it's going to instantaneously rise to full amplitude <coughs> DK for the FM is going to be set to 6, so that's 4 times slower than 4. Because every time through we're going to lose 1 64th of the amplitude. And the depth of the FM we're going to set to 9. That's a fairly small modulation. That's equivalent to shifting the modulation parameter to the right by 9 places. Can you explain what that like, actually represents in terms of the sound? Yeah, so depth is, so depth is the scale factor. Let me, let me write this out again so we can be fairly specific and not too hand wavy. We're going to be outputting a sample which is the sine of 2 pi, some f naught, plus depth times amplitude of decay times sine 2 pi fm. F, F, M. The depth is a scale factor that says how much are we going to move the frequency up and down with the FM modulation. So a depth of 1% means you're going to take the 262 fundamental and move it up and down by about 2.6 hertz. If you jack the depth up to 10%, then you're going to put, you're going to make the output uh, vary from a 262 plus or minus 26 hertz. So this is how much you're going to modify the frequency at the FM rate. A little bit of modulation sounds like uh, tremolo. A lot of modulation gets really odd because let's say you take the depth up to 100%. And 100%, someplace you're going to get a negative frequency. Oh! What does negative frequency mean? Well, it sure is going to alias. Now, you're going to have discontinuities in the waveform. And then the last, I said, okay, decay, F, yeah, okay. So those are the parameters we need to set for each voice. Okay. So each voice, each voice that you choose is going to have a separate set of frequency, modulation frequency, decay rates, and depths. Uh-uh. No. Because no. it's, it's not linear. It doesn't commute. Sure. But for uh, FM operators, can I just add more terms? Like sure, absolutely. You could, you, could have an, uh, you could have plus depth 2 times amp 2 times sine 2 pi F FM to, or you could cause this term to be modulated. Okay. Either way. Which, they, they're both equivalent? Oh, heavens no. Okay. 
who, uh, the, I mean, once you get to that point, the only way, the only way to handle FM modulation that I know of is to try a whole bunch of them, see what you like the sound of. Because it's so nonlinear, you just get the weirdest effects. Now, there's some general rules. Strings tend to make harmonically related tones, and so you would guess that you might want to have an FM modulation which is harmonically related to the fundamental. Factor of two or three bigger. On the other hand, drum heads tend to make anharmonic sounds. Drum heads tend to make sounds that have the first harmonic, the 1.58 harmonic, the second harmonic, the 2.24, the 2.56, the 2.75, and the 3. So, for that you might guess that an FM modulation that was non-integer would make it more chime or, or drum-like, struck instrument-like. But the number of sound effects you can make, how many of you played, have played with the, the sound effects on the DSP page yet? Do it! Don't wait! This is good. Instead of, instead of spending a minute and a half on Facebook, spend a minute and a half on the DSP page and play the play the examples. That's how long it'll take to play it. You can make everything from something that sounds like a struck saw blade to, to something that sounds like a string. But you need to play with it. I hate to tell you how many hours I've spent playing with the, that, this particular program, the MATLAB program. It's probably up into the days. Then main here, main is going to be very simple. I, I wrote a very cheesy debouncer for one push button. Time is some running variable. So we're just going to look at one, at uh, button zero on pin C. And not pushed. So this is the debouncer logic. We're going to set pluck equal to 1. I was thinking strings here. Pluck equals to 1. That's going to be the flag which is passed to the interrupt service routine to cause a note to start. That's the flag that's passed to the interrupt service routine. Then we need a state variable for the debouncer. Then, if it's not true that pin C and 0x01 zero zero then pushed equals 0. And then we set time equal to zero and we end the while. So everything interesting is going to happen in the interrupt service routine and in this case it has to because it has to all happen synchronously at eight kilohertz. So all main does is to check a push button and trigger a variable called plucked if we're gonna play a note. The handshake is completed in the interrupt service routine where a bunch of amplitude variables are initialized and then pluck is cleared. Jeremy. Um, where is time being incremented? In the interrupt service routine. So is 
it's an issue that it's equals equals and not greater than or equal to? Like, how do you, how can you, is this running fast enough that it'll always... It's a good point. You should be greater than or equal to, but this is running, this particular thing is running fast enough that it works. I have, however, managed to shoot myself in the foot a few times with exactly that error where I had main running just a little too slow and then the play rate went from five notes a second or four notes a second down to a note every 30, 40 seconds. Long enough for me to say, what in the world did I do? And thought I'd totally broken the whole system. Okay, so now we get down to the meat of the matter. We write the interrupt service routine for timer one, comp, a, vect, And what I did here, well, I'm not going to write two lines. I turned on timer two as a profiler. So I just turned on timer two in simple count mode to count cycles. So I could then add up the number of cycles that the interrupt service routine took and see if I was overflowing the CPU or not. But I'm not going to bother with that. What I found was that if we just use that right shift thing for incrementing the and for incrementing for, for for implementing the differential equations that the time constants are much too fast after all if you're if you're decrementing by one sixteenth of the variable every time through then an e folding time is going to be something like four or five or six samples at eight kilohertz that's a very fast decay in fact you can't hear it it's instantaneous as far as a human is concerned so what was useful to do is to slow this down by a factor of 255. If time, wow, did this actually work, setting, resetting this to zero here? Wow, that's amazing. If it equals zero, then these lower, seven, lower eight bits must be zero. So every 256 time steps, this is going to be true. And here is where we're going to implement the differential equations. So amp fall for the main sine wave is going to be amp fall main minus, oh, let's see, that's a minus, that's an underscore, yeah, a minus amp fall main right shifted by DK main. So that's the differential equation for the falling phase of the of the main of the waveform. Yeah? Anything? Yeah? No? Okay. Rise fall. Rise fall. Rise phase rise phase main. Is given by rise. Phase main minus rise phase main shifted by rise main. And the amplitude now of the FM. Amplitude of FM is going to be given by amplitude of FM minus amp of FM right shifted by DK FM. So this implements the three differential equations that we need for the rise and fall of the 
main waveform and the fall of the FM modulation. And the reason for having a fall in the FM modulation, remember, is that as time goes on, it tends to be the case that you get a more pure tone, particularly out of strings. So this simulates the cleaning up of the waveform as a function of time and becoming more pure. End. <clears throat> so right now we've we've computed a fall a rise doesn't look like a rise and then an FM fall to get the full rise though we really need to subtract this from one because what we really want is the what's uh, the one minus that for the rise time so we need to have amp amp rise main equal to some constant max amp this is going to be 32768 or thereabout you can scale it in various ways minus rise phase main and then finally we get to the point where we can write this nice function that has an exponential rise and an exponential fall amp main amp main <coughs> which is going to be given by amp rise main shifted eight times amp fall main shifted by eight and you'll remember that's because we're doing a very cheesy normalization for the fact that we're using uh, eight eight fixed point this is a cheesy approximation to an eight eight fixed point multiply <clears throat> So, whew, we finally have that. Any questions? Yeah. What advantage does exponential have over linear, where linear might be something that looks like like that? Yeah. Well, a lot of a lot of natural processes are exponential because because you tend to get an energy loss per cycle, which is proportional to the amplitude. Okay. And if that's true, then you naturally get an exponential decay. Now the rising phase is a little harder because it depends on how energy is added to the system. For a string where you're putting all the energy in as an impulse, it almost doesn't matter. The rise is instantaneous or nearly so. But for systems that have a slow buildup, you could argue whether the rise should be concave or convex and you get to choose that I chose an exponential rise and an exponential fall partly because it was easy to make it smooth without discontinuities and partly because I already knew how to do it now finally we have to do the direct digital synthesis We have to do the FM first, so we're going to have an accumulator for the FM. This is the phase accumulator. 
we're going to have the phase accumulator, which is going to be plus the increment for FM, which you remember we defined in main as a constant. Then, the high byte of the FM, the high byte of the accumulator is going to be given by car of ACC shift shift ACC FM shifted by 8 and then FM the CFM signal itself is then going to be given by sine table high FM so there's the table lookup so we increment the phase accumulator we incre increment the phase accumulator we find the high byte of the phase accumulator do a table lookup using the high byte and that gives us the new sine wave value of the FM signal. Do the same thing for main. The accumulator for main, though, is going to be obviously the phase accumulator for main added to increment main plus FM, the signal we just calculated, times the amplitude of the FM envelope shifted by the depth of the FM. One, two, yeah. Then high main is the high byte of the high byte of the main accumulator and OCR0A aha finally some output finally is 128, that's the offset for 2's complement, turns 2's complement into integer, plus amp main shifted by 8, again because of the cheesy scaling, times the integerized version of sine table times of uh, indexed by high main shifted by seven why not eight I didn't think it was loud enough We increment time, and we're done, except for one thing's missing. I'll have to do that next time. The code to actually pluck the string. All of this is going to have to be duplicated. Everything in the interrupt service routine is going to be have to duplicate, have to be duplicated for each voice. You might want to make an array of voices. That way you don't have to duplicate code and give it a whole bunch of strange names. There is, however, a small overhead for using arrays. But it's a fairly small overhead. 
Any questions? Need to go look at this, folks. Okay, last thing. Any last lingering questions about Lab 3 before we start? The one thing I have not yet done yet, I've been promising this for days now, is to draw out a state machine for, for, for building a string off the keypad. I will do that next time. Wait a minute, wait, there's a question. An announcement? Altera at 6 p.m. tonight, Lockheed, 6.30, Lockheed when? 6 p.m. tomorrow, Upson 109. 6 p.m. Upson 109 tomorrow.